Well, last week I covered the ceasefire vote in Parliament, as you can see here with this link to Rumble. Carl covered some of this stuff yesterday. Just an update, the SNP have now secured another ceasefire vote because, of course, the most important thing in Britain is a war in a foreign land that our MPs saying things about will absolutely influence. It's like asking for world peace in your Christmas list, I suppose. I think it's pretty clear at this point that now violent Islamist bobs just control the trajectory of travel, political life in Britain. And now Lee Anderson and Paul Scully, both conservative, well, one of them former conservative MPs, have gotten in trouble for noticing that exact fact. Now, Lee Anderson got in trouble, as we'll see, for saying that Sadiq Khan is in the thrall of Islamists and has given them free reign of the country, particularly the city of London. And lots of people have said, oh, either racist or a bit clumsy. No, today I'm going to show you exactly why Lee Anderson was right, should not backtrack from this, and Sadiq Khan has a history of affiliating with and even outright defending in his capacity as a lawyer, Islamists. And we shouldn't be weak on this. Now, there is. Hi, folks. Sorry to interrupt the video, but I just want to direct your attention to the aesthetics range of merch that we have on the store. These are beautiful images that I think work really well as posters or mugs. So, if you want to support us, going over to the merch store at shop.lotusita.com is easily the best way, other than signing up on the website. This. Now, there is proof that Islam takes priority, and particularly the Israel Gaza issue. Here's one example that I think deserves its own segment later on down the line. The UK has given 4.25 million in aid to the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency for life-saving treatment for women and girls in Gaza. Now, this takes the form of 100 community midwives, 20,000 menstrual hygiene management kits, and 45,000 clean delivery kits. Now, Foreign Secretary David Cameron, former Prime Minister, has said, women are bearing the brunt of the desperate humanitarian solution in Gaza today apart from all those men that are getting killed. Many thousands of women are currently pregnant and will be worrying about delivering their babies safely. This new UK funding will help make giving birth safer and improve the lives of mothers and their newborn babies. So we're really concerned about the health of babies in Gaza. Not in the UK, not, though. Not my responsibility. No. I, I don't I don't care. No. No. It's... Just as a side note, I hate the whole thing of like, but we're saving women in Gaza. So I... I I don't pay my taxes to the Gaza government. Oh, I guess I do. Yeah. Never mind. Yes. All because a bunch of Islamists want you to. And reminder again, Hamas set up shop in hospitals, so they clearly don't care about the women and girls of Gaza that caught as civilian casualties in the fire. But I would think that British babies take more priority, but at the same time that they've just dedicated 4.25 million to giving live and safe birth to babies in Gaza, the MPs are having a vote on decriminalizing abortion entirely in the UK. So if you get abortion <clears> tablets... <throat> and take them after the 24 weeks, you will no longer be prosecuted if this vote passes. This is a free vote as well, so this is not having the party whip applied to it, so all MPs can vote along this. And it's likely to pass because there's lots of pro-abortion MPs even in the Conservative Party now. It basically means that the 1861 Criminal Justice Bill won't apply to women who have abortions not in abortion clinics after the 24-week limit in the UK. So it's de facto decriminalizing infanticide. So we're paying millions for babies in Gaza to be delivered safely and then also allowing women to kill their unborn children in the UK. Now, the health secretary is backing this. She's also backed the abortion buffer zones in the UK, which means that we criminalize women like Isabel Vaughan Spruce, who are Christians, who are following the religion of the established church of the country, who are praying silently in their own head on street corners for the lives of unborn babies. Those people are getting arrested, but again, paying millions to deliver babies in Gaza. And the people who pray outside Downing Street after the October 7th massacre Zero prosecutions. Lovely to know where our government's priority lies there, isn't it? Um, also, same time, government are now announcing certificates to recognize miscarried babies. Because obviously, if you miscarry a child, that's a grievous tragedy. And I think it's totally fair for the grieving parents to get a birth certificate for that unborn, sadly died baby. So why decriminalize the abortions after 24 weeks? None of it's meant to make sense. It's just that the Palestinian babies are a carved out exception because there is an agitation group, foreign agitation group, acting on their behalf, that are compelling politicians under threat of violence to do all they can for people in Gaza because they're members of an umma. So just to, just to carve out that exception. So local man has just decided to suspect something's going on. Rishi Sunak wrote a statement. This was after the From the River to the Sea slogan was projected onto the Elizabeth Tower, housing Big Ben, the bell, that's connected to Parliament. And he said, The events of recent weeks are but the latest emerging pattern which should not be tolerated. 
A legitimate process hijacked by extremists to promote and glorify terrorism, elected representatives verbally threatened and physically and violently targeted, and anti-Semitic tropes beamed onto our own parliament building. Well, thank you for finally taking notice what you've subjected to the British public to for the last how many decades, particularly the last couple of years as Prime Minister, where you've allowed net migration to reach record levels, Rishi Sunak. Um, do you fancy saying exactly who's committed that? Don't see a single mention of Islamism in your statement. Maybe my glasses are going foggy, but I, I don't see a specific mention of who's doing this. Must well, be th away. this is just a statement. Well, what is he going to do? Last time I checked, he's a uh, prime minister. So what power does he have? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the power of the statement. You well, know, was, the power of virtue signaling. <laughs> I was talking to a Conservative Party member who happens to be a Hindu, and he was saying, like, could we at not least, if we're going to have a Hindu prime minister, get the skepticism of Islam that usually goes with it in the homeland? Can we not at least get that? Not a single mention in there. As Was it you yesterday or was it Carl who said, what would Modi do? Um, you'd expect him to be asking that question, but, but no, not a single mention of Islamism, which is the core reason, not social media, not the far right, why MPs are being threatened. And so one person did agree. Lee Anderson. Lee Anderson, former deputy party chairman who resigned over the fact that the government had defanged the Rwanda bill, and so we're not actually going to get any deportations of illegal migrants. And even if we do, we've got to pay for their bed and board there. And if they ever commit a crime in Rwanda, they get immediately sent back. So Lee Anderson turned around and said on Martin Daubeny's show on GB News, as was mentioned yesterday, I don't actually believe that these Islamists have got control of our country, but what I do believe is they've got control of Khan, they've got control of London. He's actually given our, our capital city away to his mates. He also mentioned Keir Starmer being under the thrall of Islamists, because Keir Starmer, as a lawyer, served for the defense of now proscribed terrorist group Hizbut Tahir. You know, the ones on the uh, Palestinian protests that were saying we need jihad. Important question. Yes. Uh, did Sunak back Anderson? You'll see that in a moment. You know the answer to that already, Stelios. That would require political courage, wouldn't it? So Khan said, these comments from a senior conservative are Islamophobic, anti-Muslim, and are racist. Islam is not a race, but there you go. Uh, Anderson was then suspended from the Conservative Party because he wouldn't apologise. Spokesman for Chief Whip Simon Hart said, following his refusal to apologise for comments made yesterday, this was on Monday now, uh, the Chief Whip has suspended the Conservative Whip from Lee Anderson MP. Uh, Sadiq Khan, um, there was a, uh, there's a link in there, but Sadiq Khan wrote an article for the Evening Standard. And he said, more than two days on from Lee Anderson's vile, racist, anti-Muslim and anti-Islamophobic remarks, we have yet to hear from the Prime Minister call it what it is. Islamophobic, anti-Muslim, hate and racist. With just two months to go until the mayoral elections, I hope we don't see a repeat of the divisive and deeply racist and Islamophobic campaign the Conservatives ran in 2016. Now, that's obviously what it's all about. Power. He wants to retain his seat as London mayor and continue his campaign of destroying the country, but it's important to note that he mentions the 2016 campaign where he ran against Zach Goldsmith, who is of Jewish extraction, where even David Cameron was saying, oh, Sadiq Khan has some pretty suspicious ties to Islamists, and they both retracted and apologized. However, the papers that ran the articles at the time, with proof of this connection, haven't retracted their articles, so I can only assume that they're mostly true. We'll get onto those claims shortly. In this article here, now the conservative candidate for mayor is running against Sadiq Khan has uh, caved and backed Khan over Anderson. Together, Susan Hall and Sadiq Khan sent a powerful message that fear, division, and hatred must be defeated, and no matter our backgrounds or political beliefs, we're all part of the same London community. This is the same Susan Hall that almost got in trouble a little while ago for liking posts about Enoch Powell. And behind the scenes, I can happily say, um, I actually sent the article to Susan Hall when she refused to back down from liking the Powell tweets and said, good on you, don't back to them. And she said, thank you, Connor, for your support. I was trying to set up an interview. I was. Now, I'm not going to vote for you. No way in hell, because she said, we should celebrate the diversity and tolerate each other when we have differences of opinion. That's what London has always been about. No, London has not always been the economic zone to house all of the denizens of the third world. It's actually an English city. England built it. Uh, it was a great country until lots of people turned up and started disrespecting it. Responding to Anderson's Islamist outburst against Khan, editorializing, she said, I may be one of Sadiq Khan's biggest critics, but I also see the monstrous abuse he gets as one of the country's most prominent Muslim politicians. No one should have to put up with that, and I wholly condemn anyone who does it or fuels it. His faith is one of his most positive characteristics, not something to be suspicious of. There's a reason for suspicion shortly. And I mean, frankly, as a Catholic, I don't think his faith is one of the most positive characteristics, and I don't think Sadiq Khan, in his running of the country, uh, in London, rather, has many positive characteristics, but there you go. So the reason I'm doing an update on this is because Lee Anderson gave uh, an interview yesterday and he refused to apologise. Uh, I've got two clips here. Good on Lee for doing so and that uh, he shouldn't have backed down at all. When I see the scenes out in Parliament Square last Wednesday, Patrick, 
where we have thousands of people, and it happens every Wednesday now. It's almost every Wednesday. But when they're beaming a light onto the the um, the tower, the Elizabeth Tower, the, the Big Ben Tower, which says from the rivers to the sea, and then we see just a few months back, the whole of Whitehall was taken over. We've seen threats, we've seen wicked chants, we've seen all sorts of horrible things said on these marches around our great city, in our great city, around Parliament. And then we also see last Wednesday that I think that parliamentary procedure was altered, was changed because of the threats from the Bay mob outside. That's unforgivable. We should never, never bow down to the, to the mob outside. When I see all that, I think I have a right, I believe in free speech, to say that I think Mayor Khan has lost, and the police have lost control of the streets of London. I genuinely think they have. And you have to remember, I have Jewish friends living in this, in this capital city, this wonderful capital city that's helped build this city. And they are frightened to go out. They're frightened to identify themselves. They're having bodyguards at school or uh, in extra security at school. Mm. It's absolutely shocking what's happening to our... This should be the greatest capital city on this planet. To say that he's under the control of Islamists... Though. Okay. Do you regret what that is, is, turn it, of phrase? It may be a clumsy use of language, but you've got to remember, Patrick, it was live TV. He's definitely not in control of the streets of London. On a Wednesday night, when we see the crowds out there chanting this vile venom, who's in control? Is it Sadiq Khan and the Metropolitan Police or the people on the street? But is it I his say, fault, though, Lee? Because the point is that there's laws that stop you projecting words onto the building of Parliament... Martin Dorby, our colleague, filmed that with projectors. Yes. That was being ignored by police. Yeah. You can't blame that on Sadiq Khan. That's an, that's an operational issue. Has he by spoke police. out about it, Chopper, since, since last Wednesday, from the rivers to the sea on Big Ben? Has, has Sadiq Khan actually spoke out about but it? He has no control over the police. But has he spoken he out driving? about it? No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't spoken out about it. And actually, he is the police and crime commissioner of this great city. So if he's the police and crime commissioner and he's got no input into what the police are doing, what the hell is he doing? Why is he in that, that role? Mm. I can't disagree with anything Lee said there. Absolutely spot on. And again, Sadiq Khan's silence is deafening. I have been reliably informed by many progressive activists that silence is violence. Uh, so I don't think that he's going to be saying anything about it anytime soon. And of course, I'm just going to play this quick one as well. Uh, Lee was then responding to Chris Hope, who was doing his best, I think, to appease the Ofcom impartiality arbiters when he said, oh, do you accept the charges of Islamophobia? And... Uh, it is, but let, let's decide what Islamophobia is, Patrick. Mm. Is it blasphemy? Because I think that's sort of where we're going with this. You know, you know if, you, if you blaspheme against the Lord, that is blasphemy. And I think Islamophobia is pretty much the same thing if, if you're a Muslim. These things aren't illegal. It's not illegal to criticise a religion at all in this country. But we're talking about something completely different. We're talking about Islamists, a political ideology that are intent on interfering with Parliament over there, while well, they didn't last week, and it worked last week, and it's very dangerous, Patrick, that due to the threats, the Speaker, he felt that he had to change parliamentary process in that place because of threats to MPs. So this is Ismailis, mm. you know, directly, really, you could say it's indirect, but I think directly, this influencing what goes off in Parliament. Does your party have a problem with Islamophobia? Your old, your old party, forgive me. Well, you're probably still a member of the Tory party, but... You I am, yeah. Um, what is, again, what is it? Islamophobic, criti criticising what, what's in the Quran? Is that acceptable? Well, well the government currently won't adopt uh, any, any definition of Islamophobia. Exactly. That's, but, but not doing it is part of the problem, that the Tory party has got a blind spot on this issue. Islamophobia is, I think it's, it's equivalent to blasphemy. It, that's what it is. You're criticising the religion, the teachings in, in the Quran, whatever. Is that, are we entitled to do that? Unfortunately, uh, no, we're not entitled to do that under the Public Order Acts and the Equality Act. And I am slightly confused about this tweet that Lee had put out a couple of days before. I think this was probably pre-written for him. Uh, however, I will continue to support the government's effort to call out extremism in its, all its forms without anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. So, slightly, slightly puzzling, but at least on air, he gave a robust defence for the Englishman's right to critique Islam. Now, sensible voices have come out and condemned him. Um, this is Ben Habib, of all people. Now, Ben is usually even more on the ball than Richard Tice, who leads Reform UK, and he gave a very good interview with Bo, who's also a Reform UK candidate and fellow host over at Lotus Ears, and he said, uh, I would be quite circumspect about anyone who can't express themselves accurately, clearly, and matters with great sensitivity when asked, would Lee Anderson be allowed to join the Tory, uh, not the Tory party, Reform UK, Freudian slip. And then Constantine Kissin, who's a friend of the show, 
Uh, Constantine said, Lee Anderson said was stupid and extremely unhelpful. Uh, he's given the media and political class a story they need to avoid talking about the real issue. Uh, he should apologize to Khan. Constantine also put up a Substack post uh, that, that asked, um, what, that said, what most people recognize that what Lee Anderson said is either inaccurate or a serious allegation that requires further evidence. Okay. Requires further evidence, right? You see what's funny with apologizing? It's always unidirectional. It's always from people who are from the center and the, to to the right who apologize to leftists. Yeah, because it's an open power play. Yeah, because and leftists never apologize for anything. No, they they actually just openly co-opt their most radical elements in their midst to shift the Overton window in their dialectical direction. Yes, and the, I think that this shows one of the main contradictions of the way multiculturalism is treated right now, because it's not a cure for all. No, quite. It's uh, Eric Kaufman's term, unilateral multiculturalism. It's like commanding that the dominant nation go to the World Fair and just simply celebrate the existence of the fair rather than have their own stall. But quite. So here's the evidence that Sadiq Khan is controlled by Islamists. Pretty extensive, actually. First of all, he defended Louis Farrakhan, the man who's called Jews termites and called white people devils. Uh, he said Hitler was a very great man. He applied for a UK visa in 2001, and Khan decided to defend him on quote-unquote human rights grounds. Okay, so he took one case. Maybe it's just a blip. Uh, no, actually, turns out he's got massive history of it that was uncovered around the London mayoral election. So Sadiq Khan consulted for the defense of Zacharias Muasi, the only person to be convicted in the US for 9-11. While he never met Muasi, he is pictured on camera meeting his mother. Here, we have a uh, footage of this. They're strolling down the street. Um, her name is Aika El Wafi. Uh, yeah. He's a human rights lawyer doing human rights. Yeah, just so happens to only take Islamist cases. I'm sure he's taken cases for, you know, the English Liberation Army and they've been doing No, they don't exist. No. Yeah. Uh. Mm, quite cu curious, that one, isn't it? Anyway, back to the Times article. Uh, it turns out that he didn't meet Moasi only on a technicality because Moasi actually filed by name to meet Sadiq Khan and a judge had shot it down. So he would have met him if a judge hadn't have intervened. Uh, also, Times reports, on July the 12th, 2003, less than two years before he became an MP, Khan attended the first captives conference, which was agitating for the release of terror suspects from Guantanamo Bay. The event was organized by the Islamic Observation Center, run by Yasser al-Siri, who came to the UK in 1994 after being sentenced to death in Egypt for a plot to kill a former prime minister in a car bomb, which actually killed a 12-year-old girl. Al-Siri was a member of Islamic Jihad, run by Ayman al-Zahiri, who became Osama bin Laden's deputy in Al-Qaeda. On September 2002, Al-Siri attended an event at Abu Hamza's Finsbury Park Mosque to celebrate the first anniversary of 9-11. I'm sure they were all just mourning it. In 2002, Al-Siri was charged in America with assisting Omar Abdel Raham, the blind sheikh who orchestrated the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. He was convicted in 2005. Reminder, Sadiq Khan was sharing a stage with these people. Alongside Al-Siri, Khan was on stage with Sajil Abu Ibrahim, also known as Sajil Shahid, who was a member of the later prescribed terror group al Majroon. He ran a terrorist camp in Pakistan whose graduates included Mohammed Sadiq Khan, the perpetrator of the 7-7 bombings in London. Khan also uh, spoke alongside Imam Suleiman Ghani, the Times report on the night of the Paris massacres having joined a campaign for an Islamic state. Now, Ghani denied this. David Cameron had highlighted this connection beforehand, and uh, so did Defence Secretary Michael Fallon, and both apologised for drawing this connection. Though I will draw attention to the fact that in 2023, Ghani went and ho holidayed in Afghanistan with the Taliban. Now, I know some people have also done this, but... Um, hey, they were a terrorist group back then. They're not anymore. Sure. Um, if you've got potential connections to ISIS and you've got potential connections to Sadiq Khan and Sadiq Khan's got connections to other terror groups and uh, this gentleman decided to give an interview on the Taliban state-owned TV channel, RTA, and he's also <laughs> an NHS-funded cleric, I, I might raise some eyebrows as to whether or not this is appropriate. Don't worry, the Tories are coming to the rescue. Richard Drax, a Tory MP for South Dorset, where Ghani is employed, said, I am not sure this is a wise or proportionate move. Is this all you can manage? That it? Wise or proportionate? Again, Islamists literally in our institutions connected to the London mayor, and you're throwing people out of your party for noticing it. All cowards, typical. I mean, again, Lee Anderson points out obvious truths, and he's the one punished. The Conservative Party falling over themselves to throw their own MPs out of the party. Not just this. Um, turns out Sadiq Khan's brother-in-law, former brother-in-law, London immigration lawyer, 
Makbul Javavid, uh, Javavid, I can't pronounce this, sorry, Javaid, sorry, was married to Sadiq Khan's sister until 2011. In the 90s, Javaid took part in events in London with extremist group Al Majroon uh, while he was still Khan's brother in law. Uh, he appeared alongside some of the country's most notorious hate preachers, including now banned Clemic Omar Barki. Uh, Bakri in 1997 1998. Uh, his name also appears on a fatwa in 1998 calling for a full scale war of jihad against Britain and the US. Funny because he was still living there. Khan attended a conference alongside his brother in law in 2004, but today he says he has no contact with him, hasn't for at least 10 years, and condemns his extremism. Long list of condemnations for Khan to make. Uh, it became the uh, Al Majroon became a band organization in 2005. Uh, in literature from the 90s, Javaid is described as a spokesman for the group, which calls on Muslims to fulfill their Islamic duty and launch jihad physically, financially, and verbally. So, not just an interior struggle. One video of Javaid at Trafalgar Square Valley in 1997 calls him to rail against the Kafar. Uh, his name also appeared alongside Bakri's on the, uh, on the fatwa in 1998. Uh, Javaid, now 54, Denies ever having been a spokesman for the group, even though we have the leaflets, says he never orphanized his name being included on any of the fatwas and the literature, and supposedly condemns its content. Why is he still in the country? Why is he not imprisoned? Why is he not deported? Why is Sadiq Khan allowed to walk around as if he has not got any Islamist connections whatsoever when his own former brother-in-law called for jihad and fatwa? And Lee Anderson's punished. Again. Oh, and Sadiq Khan himself had to apologise for calling Muslims Uncle Toms on Iranian state-funded TV in 2005 in Parliament while still an MP. Reminder, this was at the time that he was Minister for Community Cohesion. Who else held that title? Oh yeah, Naz Shah, even after she had retweeted an Owen Jones parody account that said grooming gang victims should shut their mouths for the sake of diversity. Yes, Keir Starmer is too under the thrall of Islamists. Oh, uh, Sadiq Khan also said, Terror attacks are just part and parcel of living in a big city. I suppose according to Sadiq Khan's policies, one must wonder why he is so permissive of these marches and various Islamist groups existing in London. Remember, all of these are political choices, and so is this, to not police Tower Bridge being shut down last week. Again, as Chris Rose, a friend of mine, says, almost like Lee Anderson had a point, but uh, you're not allowed to notice this. Um, I wonder why the police aren't policing this. Oh, it's because the police, too, are infested under Sadiq Khan with Hamas sympathizers. Uh, Scotland Yard has said it de has decided to cease engagement with Mohammed Kosbar after a social media post in January 2024. Uh, the Telegraph revealed that Kosbar was a member of the, the Forces London Muslim Communities Forum, uh, which is meant to it, liaise with the local Muslim communities, and was invited to a buffet dinner at Scotland Yard by Sir Mark Rowley, the Met Commissioner, last July. But the Telegraph disclosed, disclosed that, Mar that Mr. Kosbar had liked a post on X by Dr. Wahid Shaida, do you remember the his but to hear NHS doctor that went on Piers Morgan's show and led to his but to hear finally being prescribed? Yeah, uh, this was on January 19th, after his but to hear was already prescribed terrorist group. Shahida said he continued to speak about things he believed in, and this fella decided to like said tweet, liaising with the Met on what, uh, what Muslim protests they should police. I, I wonder why this isn't being cracked down on. So, so Lee Anderson is absolutely right. Our institutions are infested with this. Uh, the Conservative Party has decided to punish its politicians for noticing that. And we're just going to wrap up with another quick controversy that uh, happened at the same time with Paul Scully MP, former business minister. And he's claimed that Birmingham and London have no-go areas. He was on an interview for the BBC and he cited the Muslim patrols in Tower Hamlets, a council now run entirely by Bangladeshi Muslims who have been embroiled in uh, uh, boat rigging scandals in the past. And he mentioned the West Midlands and he said Birmingham and Spark Hill. Uh, we'd also have literal drill rap gang maps with their lyrics about killing people in specific postcodes being admitted in violence trials. So it's a fair statement to make. Don't worry, the West Midlands mayor, the Conservative, uh, Andy Street, has come in and said, I am for one proud to lead one of the most diverse places in Britain. The idea that Birmingham has a no-go zone is news to me. I mean, your footage yesterday of, uh, of Birmingham didn't exactly make it look prosperous, did it? I was bold and bankrupt visiting it, which um, even he, a man who will go to... Chernobyl or the Ukrainian war front line was like, this is too edgy. I'm leaving. Yeah, it was, this is not fun. It was horrible. When we went there two years ago for the Conservative Party conference, the only untouched part was the giant rainbow crosswalk with the Sky News sponsored slavery monument in the middle. The rest of it was derelict and like the rubble of the Tower of Babel. You know, thinking of Bolden Baker, like I remember there's a video of him. I think he went to recently the Afghan Pakistani border and he would just wander off. And he ended up getting surrounded by the Pakistani Secret Service, who then had to sit him down and be like, yeah, you can't go any further on this journey. It's literally too dangerous. 
who are blocking you from traveling. And he went, all right, fair enough. And then walked out into the slums of the specific place he was just in. Oh, there's people telling him in Urdu, just like, don't go down there. It's, it's really risky. And he's like, yep, yeah, cheers. See you later. But Birmingham, Birmingham is where he went, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not mental. I'm leaving this place. But didn't you know, according to the mayor of the West Midlands, diversity is our strength. There are absolutely no <laughs> no-go zones. Oh, maybe you should take that up with Birmingham Live, terrified residents avoiding Midland Town's no-go zones overrun by crime. Last year, 11th of April, 2023. Paul Scully is not making it up. He's literally citing the words of an Onward report, which contributes to the Conservative Party and has been sponsored by Conservative ministers, and Birmingham Live, local reporting. Now, this is in Andy Street's jurisdiction in the West Midlands. They're talking about Warsaw here which has become one of the most dangerous parts of the black country, following a series of killings and other violent attacks over recent months that have left locals worried. And uh, they've mentioned in here this gentleman who was killed on a night out, Akeem Francis Kerr. Yes, definitely not a, uh, a man of foreign extraction or with a Muslim background, judging by the name and the beard. Um, I'm sure he's really happy to hear that there's no violence and no no-go zones now that he's dead. Now, Scully has since doubled down. I mean, number 10 were asked, do they agree with him? And Rishi Sunak, again, as you've said, Stelios, has decided to support his MPs. When asked if the Prime Minister agreed with Mr. Scully, a spokesperson for Rishi said no, and the PM has talked before about the value of the very diverse communities and societies we have in the UK. Go there without security, then. Hmm. We have multiple societies in the UK. Isn't that an interesting admission? But no, diversity is our strength, even if you're getting murdered. And so, thankfully, Scully has decided to uh, double down. So this was a post by Politics UK who repeated that quote. And Scully said, And I've distanced myself from the person that Number 10 recently felt suitable to be deputy chair of the party. Oof. So the Conservative Party are facing an internal coup. I mean, Scully didn't back Lee Anderson, which I think is utterly cowardly. Neither of most Tory MPs come out and back Lee Anderson. They've just said, oh, it might be a bit clumsy, but he's alluding to something that's sort of true. No, no, it wasn't clumsy. It was truthful. Sadiq Khan has repeatedly surrounded himself with voluntarily and defended Islamists. And excuse me if I think that he lied repeatedly about you, Les, and pay by mile, that he might be lying about this too. Paul Scully, too, said the right thing about no-go zones. The Conservative Party are just trying to gaslight you into thinking they're not culpable for this problem. Even when decades of the British public have been threatened, has now caught up with them and MPs are threatened. So I can only presume that they want this policy to keep going on and for you and their MPs to feel threatened. Um, so this is just, again, another reason why I won't be voting Conservative, because I don't stand by their MPs and they tell the truth. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium contents on the site, such as the Epoch series, this episode on Edward I, Part 3. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Twitter at lotusheaters underscore com on Twitter. Thank you and goodbye.